I have a quick story about showing up. So it was a callback for Green Lantern. And that same callback was during the Super Bowl parade. We had just won. And I'm like, why would they choose this? But Hollywood doesn't care. <laughs> they don't, they care. don't care. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to drive in. And I'm like suited up because I'm one of the DEO agents, right? Trench coat, black suit, the whole nine. I'm riding my bike, right? This car is coming out of nowhere. It doesn't see me. Bam, I get smacked, right? I'm like, my shirt's ripped. I'm bloody the whole nine. And she's like, don't, don't sue me. Don't sue me. You need to go to the hospital. I was like, I need to go to my callback. And so I get in her car. I just hop in her car. Her uh, kid's sitting there. That's fantastic. And she's like, what? What are you saying? For Got me. the lady who smashed you <laughs> to she, drive yes, you. She drove oh, me to the fantastic. Renaissance Hotel. That's awesome. I get there. The director was like, are you okay? He was from New Zealand. Are you okay, mate? And I was like, yeah, I'm great, man. Let's go. You know, so I ended up booking it. That's awesome. You know, and like every day on set, they were like, this guy got hit by a car <laughs> and he still showed up, you know? So it was really, you know, it was really cool that I was, you know, able to like create that impression. Absolutely. Hey, I'm Armando Leduc, producer, film actor, and owner of Leduc Entertainment. I've chosen a life off the beaten path and wanted to find others that are doing the same. Spaghetti on the Wall is a show based on all of the years that I've thrown spaghetti on the wall and nurtured what's stuck. We will share fun stories, ideas, tips, tricks, and more. Welcome to Spaghetti on the Wall. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on when you're consuming this podcast. Spaghetti on the Wall, once again for another week. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Michael Arata. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right? Thank you, Armando. How are you, bud? Oh, man. Great. Good. Great. Is our morning time, uh, do you uh, consume podcasts? I do consume podcasts. In morning times? Drive time podcasts are my thing, man. What, what are your podcasts you listen to? So, uh, History That Doesn't Suck is one of my favorites because I'm in the car with the kids driving my kids to school Very and cool. there's a fantastic little podcast called history that doesn't suck and it doesn't suck. That's awesome. Who, kids love it. Who's a guy or a girl? Uh, it's a guy. He's a history professor at the university. I think of like San Diego uh, or, or Santa Barbara it does a fantastic job. That's you know, cool. Takes a fun kind of twist on history. It's not the usual, just dry kind of stuff, but I like, uh, there's another kind of crazy. This is going to make me sound super boring, but the Explorers podcast, which also is history because I'm just every time I'm in the car with the kids doing stuff like that. And um, uh, what is it? Three Smart Guys. Three Smart Guys. You hear that? You listen to that one? I, I listen to Smart List. A smart List. Is That's that what it is? Yeah, oh, yeah. Smart List. Yeah. Jason Bateman. Jason Bateman. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. That, those, yeah. They're 100%. fantastic. Love They're that fantastic. show. Fantastic. And uh, a few others. Can I flip through stuff? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be a now a, a devotee of Spaghetti on the Wall, bud. Oh, what? Well. Look, I appreciate that. Absolutely. You know? Very cool. I'm so glad you came. Um, if you guys don't know Michael Arada, um, he, he, you're from New Orleans, right? I am. Um, you know, major film producer here in town. Um, super cool. You, Your film was uh, the one that I got my SAG card on. I loved hearing that. Yeah, it was uh, Pool Boys back Could, in the day. I remember it very well. And in fact, you and I met on Pool Boys. And uh, I tell people this all the time because people come up to me all the time and say, man, listen, I love what you do. I want to be a producer. What do I do to get started? And I tell them just what I told you when I met you because you said that. You're like, I love what you're doing, man. I want to be in this business. And I said, that's the first thing you have to have is the initiative to actually make the first move to say, hey, man, this is what I want to do and kind of make a declaration and put your flag in the ground and, and start doing it. And I have to tell you, I've followed your career. That was a long time ago, long 2007, time. maybe yeah. something like that. Right. Yeah. 2006, 2007, uh, we filmed 2007. And so from that moment to this moment, you've done a fantastic job and I'm love catching up with you, man. So much appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, tenacity. Gotta I've been it. reading this book. It's called the six types of working genius. Have you read it? No, I haven't. Tell oh, me about man. it. It's fantastic. So they talk about and, and I've mentioned this on the show before, but it's such a good book that, that like transformational for my business for sure. But there, the acronym is called widget and it's wonder invention, um, discernment, galvanizing enablement and tenacity. And so ba basically they say people have like two strong personality types and then two that are frustrations for them. Not to say that they can't do it, but they're just frustrations. So wonder are people that are like super curious, always asking questions, 
ideation or invention is people that are just like ideas all day. Right. Uh, discernment are the people that are good at gut, like instinct as to whether or not these ideas are good. Yeah. Then you have galvanizing people that are good at uh, motivating others to like move. Enablement are people that are like Johnny on the spot, just really good support system. Don't necessarily need the spotlight, but they're just there. And then tenacity is like the people that need to see the projects get finished. Yeah. Right. Well, so listen, so I'm the last three for sure. Right. So one really? of the things I've always, yeah. One of the things I've always like known as a strong suit of mine um, is I'm able to take a large group of people, spread my arms out as wide as I can, point in a direction and push everybody forward saying, we're going that way. Yeah. And you're coming with me and get everybody on the same mindset, get everybody on the same page so that you're all working towards unanimity, the same purpose. And you know, you've been a lot, you've been around long enough. You've been on film sets or production theater, production sets, or whatever it's been podcasts where if you have somebody who's off script, if you have somebody who's not on the same page, same mindset as everybody else, it doesn't destroy the project, but it really hinders the first part of that, like the wonder and the inspiration, right? Yeah. So those things thrive, I think, from setting up a foundation that everybody works at their maximum capacity, maximum effort, yeah. maximum enjoyment, right? And so if you can achieve that by structuring the frame properly, then I think the first three things can come to four. Uh, and I, and it's funny, man, I've never really, I've never really wanted to cross the boundary and be like, Hey, you know, why don't you direct? Why don't you do this? Like, I, I was like, man, I really, <laughs> I'm good at what I'm good at. Yeah. And I love, I love the role I, I'm assigned to. I love it. Yeah. And I don't 100%. necessarily need to have like the wonder and the inspiration. I have good instincts. I got great gut. Right. So the second or the third. Yeah. Um, the discernment. Yeah. yeah. So I actually am pretty good at that too. Right. I have pretty good instincts and a good gut judgment on things, but I, I've been pretty fortunate of like being people, being around people like you who actually excel too at the first part of that. Right. Yeah. Who have the wonderment, who have the inspiration, the creativity. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so my sister, who's my project manager and my COO, they're like really high on the discernment level. And I used to think that they were just always shitting on my ideas. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, what, what is the deal? You know? Right. And they're like, well, you haven't really thought about this, 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 this. And I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. I hadn't really been thinking about that. And up until the, I read that book, I just was really thinking that they were just pooping on my parade. And I had to go back and apologize. I was like, man, I'm sorry. I, I see now that, that, that that's y'all's genius. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come up with the ideas. I'm going to present them. Y'all will pick it apart. And then we can go into how are we going to get it you know, moving and what are the steps that we need to take to get it across the finish line? Which brings me to my question to you yeah. in terms of when your when you've your first film that you produced, okay. right? I mean, that's got to be the mountain. Like that, like people say, you know, your first million is the hard hardest, right? What was that like? Like going, all right, I'm going to produce this movie, my first film ever. And what was the first film that, that you produced? So it was a movie. Francis James is a local filmmaker. It's a terrific cinematographer. Mm -hmm. And he had a movie called Tony Bravo. And um, he is a writer, director, cinematographer who has fantastic ideas. He fills up categories one and two, right? right? But he, like you, was like, why, you know, why am I having trouble getting this off the mark? And he had cast the movie. He just didn't have the structure to put it in place. And so he and I had known each other for a while. He and I, he was actually the cinematographer on a movie that I did when I was in law school, uh, a short film that I was acting in that won some awards in the uh, short film festivals around the country back then. And uh, he called and he's like, Michael, man, I need your help to put this movie together. And I had all the experience of basically acting in movies and acting in theater. And because <laughs> I thought to myself, like, this is going to be a blast. I just jumped in, had no clue about what to do, but I'm naturally a problem solver. And I'm naturally like, you know, you talked about the the widget. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm the, let's talk about the last four of those. Like those things just came natural to me. I had no idea at the time, but I'm good at organization. Right. I'm good at structure. I'm good at actually figuring out how to get stuff done and financed and, and talking to people and, and, and actually asking people for help, which is a hesitation. A lot of people in our business have like, Oh, I'm not sure whether I can ask somebody to help me right. fulfill my life's dream. Like it's your friggin' life's dream, man. Yeah. If you're not going to ask them to help with that, what are you going to ask them to help with? So I'm pretty good at that. And so Francis and I teamed up and we produced 
Tony Bravo, and it was a four to five hundred thousand dollar handmade local film that was just totally like a wonderful experience of figuring out what is craft services and why is that necessary and what are these things and how do you schedule something and how do you even what's a budget how do you even know what a budget is and we learned the hard way on that and and it was the hard way but we met so many people and we did so many things together that like you know it created a sense of like okay this is something we can accomplish it's not above us it's definitely not foreign it's not like some mysterious type of thing anymore like once you get into it and you know this because you remember your first film like once you do it you realize oh shit man this is hard work. Yeah. And if you're not prepared to do the work, then it'll overwhelm you and, and, and frustrate you like you talked about. Like totally. there's a high frustration level. I think a high frustration level comes from not pre- being prepared enough and not being prepared for the amount of work that it's going to take to actually get that kind of stuff done. Would you say that the first... When was that, by the way? Wow. Tony Bravo was probably in 1989. Oh, wow. 1990. I think it was 1990. That's awesome. Yeah, it was incredible. A lot of fun. We were young, man. We was all like, everybody's like, all I got is energy and time, yeah. right? I think sometimes when the the not, the ignorance of what it takes to make a film probably is higher, you know, is, is, the, is, is the thing that like, you're like, ah, oh, jump, you jump in blind. You don't really care. So would you say that the second film was a little bit harder in terms of that, because you knew now what you were up against? Yes, absolutely. And the stakes were raised, right? Because we had done it once before, we got to do it again. And, and actually, even though the movie, the movie Tony Bravo turned out really well from a structure standpoint, like it was perfectly edited, the movie was great. Um, there were some casting choices that were like, oh man, that didn't, you know, that just didn't work out the way we thought it was going to work out. Right. But the movie structurally was fantastic. And so we had, you know, expectations, right? Expectations are raised. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it was a little bit harder the second time. It, uh, the, this is what I learned that I was always shocked by. No matter how many times you do it, it's almost like you always start at zero again, right? You have experience. Yeah. So, you know, like, okay, I'm going to face these obstacles. Like there's a fight <laughs> right around, <laughs> put the, put your gloves on, man. Cause there's going to be a brawl right around the corner, but at least you know it and you're prepared for it. Um, but I always get the sense that like every movie that we start, we always start with the same struggles, always start with the same challenges. There's always going to be issues about casting. There's always going to be issues about financing. There's always going to be issues about scheduling and personality conflicts, locations, locations, all of it, man, all of that shit. It never is unrelenting, but you also have to be unrelenting. And so, uh, uh, I think the experience for, for projects number two and the project number two, we went from like a handmade, local $400,000 project to a movie where we had Academy Award winner. We had multiple award winners in it. We had a much bigger budget, um, you know, and, and, and like producers from Los Angeles in, but we prided ourselves because it was a Louisiana written, Louisiana shot, Louisiana financed, Louisiana produced project. And I have to tell you, I'm on like that movie. And that was called home front. And we filmed that in, um, that was probably 99 to 2000. That was a pretty big, pretty big film. Um, and Glenn Petrie was the writer director of that. Oh, I know Glenn. Yeah. yeah. Glenn's awesome. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, it was fantastic to work with Glenn. And so he, um, he had a lot of contacts in the business, but we wanted to do it all Louisiana and we did it all Louisiana, but it was funny. Like after we did that movie, we, my business partner, Jerry Daigle and I, we're literally like sitting in your office, like we're sitting, we're sitting in our office, like you're, we're sitting in yours now. And we got calls like, Hey, are you guys are the guys from Louisiana who did that movie? And so it opened up doors like you wouldn't believe. And wow. it, we thought like, you know, doing Tony Bravo was a blast and that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of like grit and tough effort. This, uh, home front really opened the doors for us to kind of take it to another level where, you know, we were like, oh, well, those are, they've done movies already. You know, they finance movies already. They know how to get stuff done. Right. And it kind of changed our, it changed our platform um, from having, to ch- having like, ah, oh, well, how do we find the next project to projects really coming at us and having an opportunity to like, Pick again. And choose, right? Yeah. So we get into the widget again, man. <laughs> right? Yeah. Which one it causes the wonder? Which one is the inspiration? Which one is that? And again, thankfully, I'm not, 
I don't even pretend to have those skill sets, but my business partner does. And we rely on people like you who are creative who can say like, hey, man, this is going to work and this is why it's going to work. And these are the elements that we're going to make it. And then you get buy-in, and then once you have buy-in, then yeah, man, everybody's on better start on board. Well, spread your arms out. It just, so how are you? So how are you doing that now in terms of picking projects? Is it you know at, at this point in your career, it's like all right, it I don't maybe it's not money chasing, maybe it's you know creative or you yeah. know, and then I'm gonna ask you about sure. you know how you know based on like what's happening with just. AI and well, social media and how this how this is going to be affecting the uh, the film yeah. business going forward. So thankfully, a bunch uh, most of our business now is distributor driven, and so we've been producing long enough to we actually get contacted and say, "Hey, I have a project, and I'd like you guys to do it. And here's what I think the budget is. We'll structure the budget with you, and let's go film it." And so you know the, you know this because the first challenge of of coming up with a movie is like okay so how are we going to make our money back from doing this right it's a business right and it's you can't ever not take that into consideration it's a business and so we went from really having to like chase the distribution to now like having projects that already have distribution so a huge element was lifted and so now we can say like well i don't want to you know i don't necessarily want to want to do that with that group right let's do it with this group um, that's been a real relief. Uh, that's you have, good. Yeah. You have my picture up here with my two boys. Like my wife and I decided we were traveling so much and I was so many, I was on the road quite a lot. And that's a picture in New York. We were traveling then, but we decided, you know, let's stay here and do as much as we possibly can here. And so we do, and we also have a chance to select projects. Now, just saying that Armando, like, you know, the last project we did was up in Morristown, New Jersey. And then the one before that was in Alton, England. <laughs> And the one we're doing now is in Jackson, Mississippi. And then we're going to do another one. We were going to go to the Tahitian Isles. You know, like it's all, it's all over. But Isn't that what Adam Sandler does now? He's like, I want to go on vacation <laughs> in Hawaii. Seriously. So we're just going to go shoot a movie in Hawaii. Yes, that's why not. Yes, right? 100%. Why not? And so my kids, we all like the kids needed passports to get to England. So we got their passports and that was a blast. And there was a movie we were going to film in the Tenerife, uh, in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. That's awesome. Oh, it's fantastic, right? And so all of a sudden this hurt this, but you know the crazy shit like that is all of a sudden they have a volcano that explodes. It's like being here in July and August and right. September, like, hey, we can't film because there's a hurricane. They had a volcano erupt. There's volcano season? <laughs> is there a season for volcanoes? I didn't, I didn't Damn. know. <laughs> had no the idea. challenges we face. That is crazy. Yeah. You ever read that book, Relentless? I have actually. Tim Grover. Yes. Oh man, what a good book. Yeah. What a good book. Yeah. What is it? What What is it that like? Are you just insane like me? Like you know, we just have that thing in our brains. You know, like adrenaline junkies that love like heights that I just I'm not. You know, I'm not all about. You know, but like that's their thing, right? For me, it's like, how can I make myself so uncomfortable? <laughs> in terms of like overextending myself, you know, and then really like, you know, loving that challenge, you know, and I'm finding it at 43, I'm like, man, how do I, how do I now create more, you know, fear and, and in climbing out of my comfort zone at this age? Wow. I don't, buddy. I mean, just keep staying in the business. It's going to happen to yeah, you yeah. because I don't know if a project that I've ever been involved with that hasn't felt like the total fucking collapse of the business was re imminent and it was going to happen. And as hard as I was trying to hold it in place, it was going to overwhelm all of us. And yet it never did. It never, <laughs> it never did. And you got the feeling like, cause you've stood on your own sets and you'd be like, man, I made this shit happen. Yeah. I created all this shit. Yeah. And by the way, people are going to be watching this in five to 10 years from now. And I'm going to be standing right here right now, having created joy for somebody years down the road. And there's a sense that you get from that, like, man, we've withstood all of the insanity. And so I do think like when you talk about like the fear and the trepidation and the craziness that goes through with it, like how many times have you quit this friggin' business, right? How many times Too have many you been to like, count, man, I, uh, from I, an acting perspective, of course, <sighs> right. You just got to get out. Right. Cause it's too much pain. There's not enough reward in People it. People don't get it. The, right. But the, the sense of like accomplishment that you can get. And I do think this, like I played football in college. I was a college athlete and I love that sense of teamwork. Right. Cause it's the same thing. Unanimity, 
You got to be on the same page. You all got to be working together. You all got to be busting your ass. And if there's one person slacking off, the whole thing comes crashing yeah. down. And so I actually found that when I was doing theater in college. Like, wow, we had an English teacher. I told us I had a radio interview last week. There was an English teacher we had. She was beautiful. And uh, me and a bunch of the football players, she had us sitting on the front row because <laughs> she wanted to make sure that we weren't d- disturbing the class too much. Anyway, she was like, you guys should be in the play. They're doing this play, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, and they need a bunch of knuckleheads, big, like, cowboy-like guys. Like, you guys should go do that. And so we did, and I wasn't the only one. We are like, man, this is a blast. There were girls there, yeah. right? They were like, they were like this, is, this, is a, this is awesome. And so I also got the sense of, like, man, this is the same kind of shit. You got to practice. You got to know what to do, and you got to do it on game day. Yeah. And I, and there were so many parallels along the way that it was like this natural progression for me to go from being an athlete to being somebody who was in the entertainment business. Cause I felt the same camaraderie. I felt the same jubilation. Like when we kicked ass, yeah. I felt like the same suffering. We, <laughs> you're like, we got to work another 15 hour day today. <laughs> right. Everybody's going to be miserable. Yeah. It's the same horrible experience we had yesterday Yeah, <laughs> and we're going to have it again tomorrow. But there's the weekend. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. I, I, there were so many parallels. It was like this great kind of like, I felt blessed. I was like, man, that's, I found something in my life that I could still hang all of these things that I had in my mind about what I really enjoyed about sports and what I really enjoyed about that experience into a profession. Yeah. Um, do you f- like go just from project to project? Do you like to like, just kind of have things in the chamber ready, ready to roll. I mean, that's just, yeah, you have to, like, I think we have to as a business, like we've always got one going and we've always got three or four that we're chasing and you're always chasing them. Nothing's ever set. Right. And so right. we had this project that was going to go and it was definitely going to go. And all of a sudden the guy was going to be in it. And, and it was this fantastic Terrence Howard movie and Terrence Howard had, had just gotten off of empire. And he's like, I, I just don't want to work right now. And it's like, okay, what are you going to do? So that project Damn. collapsed, right? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's, but that's the kind of shit where. And people have been working for months and they're like, yeah, this is happening. Yeah. And we're all working, right? And all of a sudden he's like, man, I love this. I definitely want to do it. And I can't do it right now. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, well, that's, that's our rotation. So we usually have two or three things going, or at least we're chasing two or three things. We have one thing going. Um, and so the thing we have right now is called the movers. It's a, it's a cool little project. It's got Christopher Lloyd and Jenna Malone. And cool. Yeah, it's going to be filmed. We're going to film that in Jackson. Let me put you in it. You know? Let me know, so, man. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a fun little sci-fi type horror movie. It's a, an Italian-American director named uh, Giorgio Serafina. And he wrote the script. And it's a, it's a fun, little, cool. fun little project. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yep. So how many, how many films are you doing on a yearly basis right now? You Usually think? three. About three. Yeah. I mean, you can't do. That's a lot. Two is, two is the, two is a a kind of a comfortable amount. We try to like pack as many in. Cause I think to myself, like, you know what? Like you, like I'm 57. You know what I mean? Like I woke up, I was like, holy, how did that happen? Right. Right. And so, you know, and you realize like how much, how much more of a grind can you keep doing this? Like, I want to keep going. I absolutely want to keep going. Yeah. My oldest kid loves it. He oh, loves, he's in the business now? Uh, well, no, but he's... But, but he, he wants like, to be. Yeah, he loves being on the set, right? And he takes yeah. his phone and he's filming stuff. And um, he and his little brother have their own like, little YouTube thing going. Yeah. And they like film stuff and they film their friends. And, and so, so he's got an aptitude and they like it. And I want to kind of keep going as much as that. But quite honestly, man, you know, it's like I wouldn't mind just doing one project a year or two projects a year um, and kind of calling it a day after that. But I'm, you know... I, I mean, could you turn down jobs? No. Of course you can't. No. So then you when someone calls you and yeah. you're like, I got a project, you're like, I don't even care what it's called. I'm in. Right. When do we start? Well, and the thing, and, and to your point, right, like you were like, oh, I want to work with those people. Like they're, they're little families, they're little cliques. I mean, I know people are like, oh, the, the film business can be super clicky, but it's like, well, when you know what the recipe is and, the, and all the cooks in the kitchen, well, then- Let's keep doing that. Right? Like, you why can, would you want to change things? Correct. And you can rely on them, right? Yeah. So that person hasn't let you down. That person hasn't disappointed you. That person's come through and they've done everything they said they were going to do. Or maybe not everything, but they, sure. they, they showed up. Yeah. And you know this, like the old adage, like showing up's 90%. Like it's really 90%. 
it's showing up. It is a lot. mind blowing how many people don't have a work ethic these days. Show that up. Are, that are just just show up. Yeah, man. Sometimes, sometimes you is, just get lucky. To your point, the Pool Boys movie. I was doing stand in work, yeah. right? And up to that point, I was always just doing doing extra work, extra work. I moved here for the the business. Okay. I was reading. I was, you know, taking acting class and the whole the whole nine. And then I think one of the actors fell out. Okay. One of the uh, lead actors and um, and and they were like, yeah, there's there's a there's a opportunity to audition for this role, and I auditioned, didn't get it, but then you guys wrote me into the movie, and that's how I got, you know, uh, it was a scene with Tom Arnold, and I got my oh, yeah. uh, sad card off of that, you know, but it was you know it was just showing up, being there at the right time, and then all of a sudden opportunities present themselves, so you never know, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I no doubt about it. Yeah. I. Uh, this is that's how the business works and i was just going to say this and i'll tell a quick little story like that um you know this this business doesn't tolerate like uh laziness and if you don't show up then you don't survive right and my niece got into this business she asked me like what do i do i was like you got to show up because once you show up and you keep showing up and you do the work that people ask you to do they go on to another project and they say you're coming with me yeah. Right. You ready to do the next one? We're going to do the next one. And she went from job to job to job and she loved it. Right. And so that's, it's not a secret. It's like, you got to be prepared to do the work. Um, but I also love the, the opportunity that it creates. Like you just had, like you just talked about on, on, uh, on pool boys. Like to me, like that, I had that crazy experience. I'd crashed, uh, I crashed a casting session for a TV show called, uh, unsolved, mysteries oh wow you remember that show yeah. oh yeah i mean this was in the this was in the early to mid 90s it's a good uh, show it was a terrific show a right show. they were filming in baton rouge and the was, reenactments yeah 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 and it was about the uh, assassination of huey long in baton rouge and i thought to myself i'm gonna go and i'm gonna audition for that and but i wasn't invited to audition and i almost didn't know enough this is the youthful thing right right i almost didn't know <laughs> enough that you couldn't just show up and not be invited in. So I was like, I showed up and uh, there was a local actor, Leon Conovespri was there. And Leon was up for a role. And Leon's been a long time theater guy. And I had known Leon from the theater world. And uh, he was sitting there and he's like, well, what are you doing here? I was like, I'm gonna audition. He's like, uh, who, who sent you? Who's your agent? I was like, I'm my agent and I, <laughs> I sent me. And so the casting director walks out and it's just me and Leon and she's like, who are you? I was like, hey, I'm Michael Aradam. Here to audition. She's like, what are you auditioning for? I was like, what you got? And so she put me in a TV series. And, uh, and I had one role in that, and I had another role in another uh, uh, thing, but I got cast in that. And those crazy little things, that paid me because we worked three or four days, and one of them was like a holiday weekend. And I just remember thinking, like, what a friggin' crazy opportunity that is for somebody with yeah. some ambition to just walk in and say, like, like you did, like, hey, man, I'm going to be here. And if you guys need somebody, choose me, right? Being open to it and, yeah. and, and kind of pushing yourself to the forefront. I have a quick story about showing up. I was, um, so it was a callback for Green Lantern. And that same callback was during the Super Bowl parade. We had just won. And I'm like, why would they choose this? But Hollywood doesn't uh, uh, care. They don't, they don't care. care. And it's, it's on, on Chapatulis over the oh, Renaissance Hotel. And course, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to drive in. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to and I'm like suited up because I'm one of the DEO agents. Right. Trench coat, black suit, the whole nine. I'm riding my bike. Right. This car is coming out of nowhere. It doesn't see me. Bam. I get smacked. Right. I'm oh, like underneath man. the car. Right. I'm like my shirt's ripped. I'm bloody the whole nine. Woman's like, oh, don't you know, and my 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 bike's a you at this point. Me thinking I'm going to get on the bike. And, and, and she's like, don't don't sue me. Don't sue me. Do you need to go to the hospital? I was like. I need to go to my callback. And so I get in her car. I just hop in her car. Her right. kid's sitting there. That's fantastic. And she's like, what? What are you saying? And I was like, I, it's a big movie. I, I'm an actor. I got to go. Like, you've got to drive me to the Renaissance Hotel. That's what you, you can do for me. you got the lady who smashed you to she, drive yes, you. She drove oh, me to the fantastic. Renaissance Hotel. That's awesome. I get there. Uh, Finn Cannons are, are, are yeah, casting. Yeah. 
and Lisa and, and I'm I'm there. The actor's like, "What is what? Are, what are you doing, dude? Like, I'm all disheveled." And she's like, "Armando, what what's happening?" And I was like, "I got hit by a car. Like, wait, I gotta go in." She's like, "Oh my, don't you go to the hospital?" I was like, "After." I do this thing, <laughs> right? So she gets me in immediately. That's it's the guy there. to put on the screen. Oh, my God. They were like, uh, you know, the director was like, are you okay? He was from New Zealand. Are you okay, mate? And I was like, yeah, I'm great, man. Let's go. You know, so I ended up booking it. That's awesome. You know, and like every day on set, they were like, this guy got hit by a car <laughs> and he still showed up. You know, so it was really, you know, it was really cool that I was, you know, able to like, create that impression absolutely yeah well, you didn't create that impression i mean you lived well i that made impression. yes i lived that impression yes, yes. so yeah, i made I mean, you know talk about showing that's real up, man that's real yeah so but i was man it was like even in your 20s you just like you want it yeah. so effing bad yeah and you know? you know what so um you asked a question a little earlier about like work working and stuff like that i do think uh i do think the desire doesn't leave it's just that we get more responsibility like you have you have you have children you're a yeah. father right and yeah. it's like and, and as soon as that happens you realize like wow that's that's important man. yeah I want to spend a lot of time with that and so I have kind of scaled back on a bunch of the stuff we're doing but um, you know I don't think I could ever really abandon and I don't want to like the desire is still there like I want to keep making projects and yeah I'll, I'll say this man I told uh, one of the guys we work with, we, I go see movies in theater all the time, right? I try to see as many movies in the theater as I possibly can because that's the greatest experience you can have as a movie maker and as a movie watcher. Yeah. And uh, I took my kids to see Maverick, right? And I walked out of Maverick thinking, man, I'm so fucking proud to be able to do that. Yeah. To be in the business where you can have that kind of impact on people. And, you know, I was, I'm 50s. Like I said, I'm in my mid-50s. And I was like, that inspired me to work harder to try to do something that's spectacular with the resources we have. Like, so he's got different resources, right? He's got, he's got everything he wants. Yeah. And he created something that was magical and spectacular and thrilling and funny and all the things that we think about, like we want our movies to be. And I remember walking out of there being like, man, that, that fucking lit the candle on me, man. I'm inspired. To that's awesome. So I really did. I kind of walked out thinking like our next movies, I want to start choosing movies. You were asking like, how do you choose? So we started thinking like, let's choose movies where we can really start to like make some kind of impact and ha try to like, try to make it special as, as, as special as we can. Um, and so we're in the kind of, that's the phase we're in right now, right? Instead of just, I want to eat the old adage about the two buffaloes sitting on the mountain, no, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to be there. I, I want to just choose now and try to do the things that I think are really important and yeah. really focus and burn it up and. Just kill those, right? Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of where I am from a from a professional standpoint. As like, um, you know, that's that's the stamp I want to I want to put on the projects right now. Where do you see the film business going in terms of like content? Is just so ubiquitous. There's yeah. so much content, right? Are people making as much money from these films as they used to? No. What's the yeah? So. What is the, um, where do you see this sort of going? <clears throat> okay, so we're d totally in a transition period right now, right? And nobody knows where it's really going, so that's the answer. Nobody knows. Right. And you know this because you've been around long enough. Like, you know, anytime you think people really know what they're doing and know what's going on, they don't. We're right. all just making it up <laughs> as we go along. I've been around and you've been around long enough to realize, like, I just want to keep going day after day after day and keep going. But there is something that's happening, and you mentioned this with AI and some of the other technology. Um, um, so we're actually finishing and we're editing and uh, uh, we're releasing a movie, the movie that we shot in England right now. It's, a, it's a, a, a movie that was written by a guy in Houston, Pav Grover, who's a terrific action writer. And uh, it has Jonathan Reese Myers in it. It has Alec Baldwin in it. And we actually filmed Alec after the shooting and the distributors, I thought, I got to tell you this, like I, I really thought that the distributors were going to stand up and that adult was going to stand up and be like, hey, listen, we can't really proceed with this project, right? Because we got a guy who's the star of the project who's got a lot of issues. And uh, we had a lot of conversations with the distributors and, the, and they actually were like, you know what? We think he's going to be okay and we think the movie works with him 
and it certainly works from a financial aspect with him. So go ahead and do it. And instead of filming it in, we were going to film it in New York. We we're going to film it in New Jersey. We we're going to film it. It needs to take place in a, um, really it takes place in a plane. So we needed a plane and then it takes place in an office and we're like, well, we can film it in DC and we can film here. They have film sets there in New Jersey and New York. Anyway, I was like, let's go film it in England. And we found this place in England. It's tremendous amount of special effects. Movies have always had special effects, but the way special effects are created now, the ease at which they're done, the, the technical aspects about what you can do is so radically different than what I started off doing with, you know, the first movie we did, Tony Bravo, which also had special effects, and those special effects are cartoonish compared to what we can do now. Oh, yeah. And we actually had a lot of specialization in that. And I got to tell you, man, like I've had to study and kind of be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what is capable, what's possible right now. Because, you know, when you watch movies that have AI and you're watching movies and television that have AI in them, whether you know it or not, like AI is now doing a lot of the editing. AI is now doing a lot of the color correction. AI is now doing a lot of the sound sweetening and the things that used to take artists to do. Oh, yeah. And so... I'm old school about this, man. I love people and I like working with people. And, and I know computers and things can do stuff that we can't do and on schedules that we can't do them in. But um, it scares me a little bit about how this transforms the human aspect of our business and the creativity and the business side of that. Like, you know, I like to work with people and I'm okay actually like not having our scripts edited and, and revised by technology which is one of the things that, you know, I heard about in a seminar a couple of months ago, like how we can use AI to create stories and scripts that, you know, are audience friendly and, and what the audience wants. And if anybody ever tells you they know what the audience wants, they're full of shit. Right. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, how do they know? They don't. They don't know. They don't know. And neither does AI. And AI is mm -hmm. generated by us. We have to program all that shit. And I don't, you know, I got to tell you, I don't, want to sound like a funny daddy because I'm not like I really like technology and I've benefited from technology but um, I also benefited from like being partnered with people who are super creative and that that really drives me yeah. and I can't get as excited about like so we've been pitched on projects like here's a project that's got all these special effects and we're going to do all this AI and we can pull this in and we've got this graphics group and this great French fantastic this French company's got this fantastic new computer programming that can do all of this and they can and I was like man that sounds fantastic where do we fit in what do you need us for well you got the money you know what I mean right and so I don't know man I'm I do think storytelling is never going to end you need great storytelling um, but I'll say this anecdote as well um, so we did a movie uh, a TV project that's uh, going to be a, a, it's a pilot for a series up in New Jersey it's called the breed of greed and it's uh, it's kind of like this genre of projects now like uh, Succession and uh, Yellowstone where the wealthiest p family you could possibly imagine and they're all horrible and they devour each other and they yeah. want to devour us too and you can't keep your eyes off of them, right? right. And so we're kind of in that cycle of seeing you know, the most destructive, violent, dis horrible people destroying themselves and just taking us down with them. Right. And so we'll kind of come out of that and come on to something else soon. Uh, but that's kind of where we are right now. And I don't know if that's a, a function of like where our society is. Right. You know what I mean? But then like, you have the, the other side, like Ted Lasso. Oh, yeah, I love it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So there we might, you know, be, uh, be great. I'm glad to you brought some, that up. Yeah. I wish I would have had the chance to do the Ted Lasso version of that. I got, I got a sign like, let's go dark. Yeah. I got to tell you, and you know, like when you get in the projects, like you get into the projects, like, yeah, you take that stuff home. Yeah, man. There's a lot of that that goes around like I remember the and it infected the cast you know we had Gina Gershon who was the lead she was the matriarch of this of this family that's crazy and destructive and and she was living that shit. and all of a sudden we're living that because it's like <laughs> yeah. okay today's yeah. gonna be another horrible day right but we're gonna get through it and so yeah great director it's so crazy how that happens like it just infiltrates and you don't even know it but like you live in it, it's the, you know, it's the, that, that alternate reality that happens once you're on set. Like literally such a, you know, when you're on set, man, it's just like another 
just another realm. Hard to describe. Time stops immediately. There's never enough time. Well, that's know. true. So I'll, I'll, I'll make this point about what you just said. Um, Alec Baldwin, he and I worked together 25 years ago. And um, we, he was cast in this. We got him signed up for this. And uh, he's going through a lot. He's going through a tremendous, tremendous uh, stressor in his life, right? His life is literally on the line. He's got seven or eight kids now, and they're all super young. And he's facing like these really serious charges from the incident that happened in New Mexico. Um, I actually, this was the first time he was going to be filmed <laughs> since that. And uh, I'm the producer, right? And so I'm trying to prepare our crew and prepare everybody for it. And uh, it was, I've realized this before, but it was the most recent and it was the most crystallizing of that thought that he walked into the stage. We were on stage in, in the small town right outside of London. And as soon as he walked on stage, he realized he was home. He realized he was with his people. Mm. He realized like he's safe with us. We're not going to be pestering him about this kind of dog shit or that, or we want him to be the best. We want him to excel at what he's doing. We're there to support him. All he has to do is show up. Yeah. And he was, and you could see the strain where he had to go through the airport and get all this other stuff and he makes it all, you could see the stress a couple of days before, but as soon as he got on stress and haven't you felt that? Like where you walk on set and you're like, ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh where, yeah. It's home. Yeah. I'm just where I've been fighting to get to, man. It's where I want to be. <sighs> right. Yes. And that really, kind of gives you the really sense does. of like, why do you want to let go of that? You don't. Why don't you want to do that as often as you can? Oh. Hallelujah. Yeah, right. Hallelujah. Right. And on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Um, how, what, what's the name of your production company? It's called Voodoo Pictures. Actually, Voodoo Pictures and Buku Pictures. They're two, there's two, project, uh, two companies that kind of work side to side. They're both locally based, so we have these kind of French names. Uh, Buku Pictures does the television, and Voodoo Pictures does the films. Cool. Yeah. And then you guys, I guess, create S-Corps for the... Everyone has its own little individual LLC. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, yep. dude. I can't believe that we're done. We Bruh, went too fast, I know, man. I know. This stuff goes by. Let's do it again. This goes by. Yeah, 100%. Let's Good. do that again. Um, guys, Mike Larada, check out his films. Do you guys have, have all of your films on the website? Do you I have think a, we do, yeah. The ones voodoo, that we've already... Voodoo, yep, Voodoo Pictures voodoo, and, voodoo uh, pictures and, Boo, and Buku Pictures. And uh, we've got one coming out now. Um, 97 Minutes is going to be the Ziatic Alec Baldwin picture we talked about. That's going to be out in theaters. It's... Uh, uh, June 4th or June 5th. Um, it's going to be in, in theaters. We're going to have a big premiere in Houston, big premiere in Los Angeles. Cool. And then Breed Agreed comes out, uh, Netflix sometime November, October, November. Fantastic. Yeah, man. man. Excited about it. Thank you for being here. It's really, really, really cool to uh, interview you. I know we've been uh, talking about it for like months and you're finally here. So Thank we you. made it happen. All right, guys. Spaghetti on the Wall has been brought to you by Leduc Entertainment for all of your digital marketing needs, social media, video, we got you. And you can watch Spaghetti on the Wall anywhere. Uh, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, anywhere where you can find a podcast. And we'll see y'all next time.